Hola a todos, ¿cómo están? Yo soy Sofía Macías, autora de Pequeño Cerdo Capitalista y hoy estoy muy contenta de presentarles una entrevista que creo que les va a servir muchísimo a todas las personas que estén buscando invertir en empresas de alto crecimiento, las famosas startups, o que sean justamente una startup y estén buscando quién invierta en la suya. Nuestra entrevista de hoy es nada más y nada menos que David S. Rose, el CEO y fundador de Ghost, que es una plataforma y comunidad para inversión ángel. Si ustedes son emprendedores que buscan capital deberían de estar ahí. Si ustedes son inversionistas que buscan empresas en las cuales invertir, también deberían de estar ahí. David también es fundador asociado de Singularity University y ha fondeado más de 100 empresas pioneras. Y bueno, yo amo sus libros. Lo estuve persiguiendo justamente para esta entrevista porque yo amo Angel Investing, The Ghost Guide to Making Money and Having Fun Investing in Startups, su bestseller. Pero él también escribió The Startup Checklist, 25 Steps to a Scalable High Growth Business. Esta entrevista está en inglés porque es lo que habla David, pero no se preocupen, les hicimos algunos subtítulos que pueden activar con este iconito. Lo primero que le pregunté a David es ¿qué son las famosas inversiones de Capital Ángel? Es invertir dinero en empresas muy early stage companies, at the very, very beginning. If somebody wants to start a company from scratch, all companies start somewhere, right? Companies don't just spring fully blown from a tree. An somebody who founds a company, the company founder, in the technical term, it's an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur, word from the French, is somebody who um, instantiates a new business, who comes up with the idea and creates a new business from scratch, and then operates that business um, for some period of time. Some founders, uh, for example, Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, stay for a long time. Other founders like Pierre Omidyar, who founded eBay, um, leave very soon after founding and turn it over to a professional manager. But typically entrepreneurs start a company and operate a company. Now, there are different kinds of companies. And if you start a company that, for example, is selling your design services, if you're a designer, there are no real startup costs. You can take some uh, ads out online. You can get some clients. They, they uh, ask you to do some work for them. You do work for them. It doesn't cost you anything. It's your work. And then you can charge them and they pay your bill and, and you're in business. But there are other kinds of businesses that actually require capital beforehand. If somebody, uh, if you're trying to build a product that somebody's going to buy, um, well, you have to have money to pay for the product. Where does that come from? There are a couple of ways. One way of which is you can sell it to somebody and then say, pay me, pay me in advance. I'll use your money that you're paying me to go build the product and then I'll sell it to you. And that sometimes works. And that's the essence of um, rewards-based crowdfunding. So if a Kickstarter or Indiegogo campaign, you go on, you say, hey, here's what I'm going to build and give me your money now, pay it now. I'll use the money to go build it. But that doesn't always work. And that doesn't work for large, complex businesses, enterprise businesses. It's fine for a coffee cup, but it's not fine for a, for a larger business. So now what do you do if you're an entrepreneur, a founder who is starting a company? It's a really interesting company, potentially will be very, very successful, make a lot of money, but it requires money to start. Hmm. Well, first of all, you look in your pocket and you say, do I have the money? And if you are rich and you have the money, then that's fine. Uh, and then if you don't have the money yourself, maybe you put it on your credit card or borrow it from your bank account. And that gets scary, but okay, if you're an entrepreneur, that's what you do. But if that's not enough money, and then you can go to your, typically your friends and family um, who hopefully love you and want to support you and, and, and trust you. Um, and they don't know anything at all about the business that you're in. They don't know anything about investing or entrepreneurship, but they love you and they might give you some money to get you started. And most people, and so actually that's the sequence. Most companies, most founders start with their own money. And for those that don't, the next largest group start with money from friends and family. Okay, well, what if your friends and family don't have it or won't give it to you and you have a great idea for a great business, um, but there's no money. You need to get it from somewhere. And so what do you do? You go to a bank and you go to a bank and you say, hey, I've got this great idea. Please lend me money to start my business. You know what the bank says? No, we don't lend money to startup. Now, why? You think, well, that they have all the money. Why shouldn't they give it to startups? And the answer is because banks are not in the business of taking a risk. They're not in the business of investing in for a potential big return down the road in your company. Banks are in the business of renting money. They say, okay, if you have a need for, you know, $100 now, we'll give you $100 now that you can use. And then one year from now, you give us, say, $110 back. Um, and that's fine. And if you can do that and we know we can get it back, we'll give you the money. Well, the only problem is if you're putting that money into a new business, 
new businesses tend to be very risky. And I don't care how great an entrepreneur you are, yeah, mm, the odds are actually against the business succeeding. And so the bank doesn't want to give you $100 and, and have you come back you know, at the end of the year and say, oh, sorry, it's all gone. Their approach is, we're going to give you $100, and one year from now, you come back and give us $110 back. And you know what? If you use that $100 to start a business, and the business made a billion dollars, and you're one of the richest people in the world, congratulations, you can take me to lunch. Um, but all I want back is the $110. On the other hand, if you put it into a business and the business failed completely, you know, I'm really sorry at the end of the year, maybe I'll take you to lunch or at least buy you a hot dog, but I need that $110 back, regardless of whether the business succeeded or failed. And so therefore, they're not gonna bet on the business to succeed. They want you to sign a personal guarantee saying that you agree to pay that money back and they will not lend you that money unless they know they can get it back. So banks don't work. Well, okay, you can't, you don't have it in your pocket, you can't borrow it, you get it from friends and family, you're not gonna put it on your credit card, you can't get it from the bank. Well, what do you do? Either you pack it up and go home and say, forget this whole entrepreneurship stuff, but you are a founder, you're an entrepreneur, and you want to make this work. So you go out then to an angel investor. And an angel investor is a person what I describe as a rich-ish person. If you're a really super rich person, you don't have time to dork around with, with these little startup companies and stuff. Michael Bloomberg doesn't go around giving $25,000 to individual founders over there, right? Um, on the other hand, if you don't have any money to, to invest, you can't afford to obviously to invest in companies. So that's why I say rich-ish people. Um, <laughs> not really millionaire. You know, you know, typically millionaire level, you know, or above, but not billionaire level. Billionaires don't go doing angel investing. Millionaires do, right? Uh, in the United States, there's a, a something called accredited investor status. And so the only people in the United States who are allowed to make those kinds of investments um, are defined by the Securities and Exchange Commission as accredited investors. And what that means in the U.S. is you have to have either a million dollars in assets, you have to have a, in, in property and, and assets, not including the value of your home, right? Or you have to have a steady income of at least $200,000 every year for the last several years and show that it's going forward. Or if you buy your tax returns jointly with your spouse, $300,000. But if you meet one of those two tests, income or assets, then you are what's known as an accredited investor and you're allowed to invest. Now, frankly, if all you have is a million dollars in assets, that's a, that's not really a lot of money to be able to you know invest a fair amount in the startup company. The average amount per, that an individual investor invests in a startup company in the United States is about twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars per investor per deal. That's a lot of money if, if your total net worth is a million dollars, or you or you have a two hundred thousand dollar a year income. So typically, angel investors, most angel investors, are in the range of they're millionaires or they're multimillionaires, but they're not billionaires, right? And so what they do is they invest money at the earliest stage to with a founder who is starting a business. Now it used to be that um, most businesses to get started required a whole lot of money um to you know hire people buy equipment do all this kind of stuff uh and the only way you could get started is with if you've got an investment from an outside investor <clears throat> and so therefore you would write up a whole plan for your business called a business plan which in detail said okay here's what we're going to do here's what i'm going to spend it on here's how to make my money and so on and so forth and you would take this business plan to an investor and you'd say here's what i'm going to do um please invest and they might or might not invest what has happened in the last, oh, 10 or 20 years has been very interesting. The world has changed. And now there are so many tools online that let you, whether it's Amazon Web Services to do your back end or Salesforce.com or, or you know, online telephones, all kinds of things. Um, so today, a founder starting up can use free or very low cost services <clears throat> that would be the equal of what a giant company would have done you know, 20 years ago. And so therefore, it's actually much easier today to start a company from scratch, from nothing than it was before. So what that means is there are lots of founders, lots of entrepreneurs out there starting companies very inexpensively using all these tools and online things, Amazon for dropshipping or, or you know, Google for uh, um, you know, their, ad, their advertising and so on and so forth. Um, and they are getting pretty far down the line in their business to their, where they're actually maybe making money or having customers. Uh, and so therefore now, switching hats, that's from your founder hat, you put on your investor hat, you say, okay, if I have a choice of investing in, you know, three people, you know, and, you know, this person has an idea um, and this person has a, 
you know, I'll go over here, has a company that's really profitable and they're making a lot of money. Well, that sounds good. I'll invest the guy who's making a lot of money. The only problem is um, <laughs> they're making a lot of money. So they don't really need your money also to make more money. Uh, and so it'll be expensive to invest there. But how about, oh, this woman over here has got, you know, she's got a great idea. She's a founder. She's got enough of the business going. So she's got some initial, what we call traction. She's got enough people who say they want to buy it or they've managed to buy her first MVP, minimum viable product that they, they can do. And now she just can't fill her order. So if I invest you know, $10,000 or 50 or $100,000, that will allow her to really take it and leverage that and get really, really big. And so that's the kind of founder that angel investors like to invest in. So the, in the, in, you know, the statistics, the best statistics we have are in the United States, where we do a lot of this stuff and there are a lot of statistics. Uh, and so in the U.S., um, there are, you know, probably 200,000 people who do this kind of thing, 200,000 angel investors. And the average angel investor who's serious about this, um, and you really should take this seriously if you invest a lot of money into these kinds of companies, um, should plan to invest in not just one, two or three, but a lot of companies. In my book that you mentioned, um, Angel Investing, which is the standard textbook for starting a company, I would suggest that you should aim at at least 20 companies in your portfolio. Why? Because it's very, very risky. And if you put all your money in only one company, the odds are it's going to go down. If you invest in 20 companies, well, you know what? The odds are a lot of them are going to go down and lose your money totally. But maybe at least one is going to be a big success and make you a lot of money, which will cover all the other losses out there. So um, an angel investor typically will only be investing in several companies and you have to allocate your money across these different things. So let's say you want to invest $25,000 uh, into a company and you can invest in at least say, 10 companies. Well, that's $250,000. That's a fair amount of money over there and you want to really take this seriously. So that's a very long-winded answer to what angel investing is. Does that help? That helps a lot. Actually, you, you, I had a question regarding the number of companies because you all, you, you mentioned it a lot in, in your book that you recommend investing between in, in 20 and 80 companies because the risk is a lot. And I would like to, maybe it's a little bit, uh, you have already said it before in, the, in all this great explanation, but besides having this amount of money and besides being a person that is willing to take risks because these companies are much riskier than maybe a bakery that has already a steady a franchise and a steady income as you said or or, or a big technological company that has already been founded and not, right now it's operating and, and is already making money not only in the, in the investment early stage but really making money what else uh, do you think that a person needs to become an, an angel investor like besides liking risk and having money to be able to invest. being able to accept risk so so first of all you need to have the money right you can't invest money you don't have number two you need to be prepared to lose the money right so that's not the, i mean i don't take risks like jumping off buildings or skydiving or whatever it is right so you don't have to be a risk taker but you have to be prepared if you're going to invest the money to lose it because many many deals probably one half of all the deals that you invest in as an angel investor are going to go bankrupt, literally lose their money. So this is not like investing in the public stock market. It's not like investing in real estate. I mean, unless a tornado or a hurricane comes along, your real estate you invest in will still be there tomorrow. And it's unlikely that a public company is going to go bankrupt tomorrow the day after you buy it. That's perfectly possible to happen with an angel investment because the, these are companies that aren't profitable yet. They're just starting out in the early, early days. So you psychologically have to be prepared to lose every bit of every money you, you, you put into it, number one. Number two, you have to understand that sometimes there'll be great successes, sometimes there'll be great failures, but this is going to be a roller coaster ride, going like, like this. If you're, again, looking to invest in, you know, buy stock at Apple and you just see it go like this, well, that's not angel investing. It's a very bumpy, rough ride. Next, you have to like entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are these, are we crazy people? Because I am an entrepreneur. I'm starting your own podcast, you are too. Um, and, you know, people who are entrepreneurs just think differently from the rest of the world. The, the, the natural born entrepreneurs, and not everybody who starts a company is a natural born entrepreneur, but the natural born entrepreneurs are about 1% of the population, one out of 100 people. 
Um, and they just, we just think differently. And you have to like people like that. Otherwise, it's going to be a very painful experience investing your money behind somebody who, you know, you don't like. Um, you want to try and provide help. If you're an investor, you don't want to be a, make a pain in the neck of yourself. You don't want to call the founder every day and say, well, here's what you should be doing. But you should be there as a sounding board, as a mentor, advisor, a guide, um, somebody who they can call for advice. Um, you want to help them find other investors to raise money when it comes time for an exit. You want to see if you can help them sell the company to somebody else. Um, so there are active angels and passive angels. Uh, you want to try and add value, be a value adding angel. Not be afraid to take to, to lose money, know what you're getting into ahead of time and have the money to invest. And with all that, it can be a lot of fun because what you're doing is you're investing in a brand new company that didn't exist before. And that new company is probably doing new things. It could be a, a leading edge technology company, it could be doing new models in an old area. And that's a whole lot of fun. You were an entrepreneur before being an, uh, an angel investor. Do you think that is like useful for investing, well, not useful? I, I started my first company when I was 10 years old. Um, and so you were a very, very cute little entrepreneur. I, I show you pictures. I was an adorably cute uh, entrepreneur. Uh, and so I, uh, I started companies when I was in high school and college and business school. Um, I started a company, my first technology company, I started in 1983, um, uh, before you were born, with uh, my, my, one of my college, my business school professors. Uh, it, was a, it was a computer training company called The Computer Classroom. Um, I started my first software company a few years later, uh, in 1988. I got my first venture capital funding in 1991. So I've been doing it for a long time. I started a whole lot of companies, uh, as you mentioned in your introduction, that. Uh, I've founded uh, six companies and I've invested in over 120 at this point. Uh, so um, I've been very involved and being an entrepreneur gives me a lot of love for entrepreneurs, um, understanding of how the entrepreneurial mind works, um, able to understand that how risky it is and how much you can lose you know, your money. So uh, in the United States, for people who are active angel investors and they're, who belong to a group of other angel investors, uh, known as an angel group or angel network, the average investor who belongs to one of those groups um, has been an entrepreneur, him or herself, for 10 to 15 years uh, and has started you know, uh, between two and three companies. So I'm not sure how helpful it is, but it certainly is the norm. People who tend to be entrepreneurs when they have made some money tend to like to go back and invest in other entrepreneurs. Maybe they have more em empathy towards like entrepreneurs. They they have been there, done that. <laughs> and, really. So that's 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 really interesting. Um, the other day I had a question that was very interesting in the Facebook Live of Shark Tank Mexico, and there was a a, a guy who asked us if if investors uh, didn't invest in ideas themselves or they didn't care for ideas themselves. And there's a very interesting formula about ideas in your book, that are the ideas are worth... Right. Uh, okay. so, <laughs> so that is actually not by me, that's by a guy named Derek Sivers, uh, and it's um, in a blog post. Um, and his point is that uh, ideas are simply a multiplier of execution. Um, and so when your, your correspondent asks, do investors invest in ideas? And the answer, as I said before, is they used to, because it used to require money to make an to get an idea uh, and execute it. Today, there it is so straightforward. There are so many tools, online services, everything to let you get started. That just having an idea but not executing it, there's no excuse. And so, therefore, investors will no longer invest in just an idea. Investors invest in a company, and a company is something that's been set up to execute your idea. And uh, Derek Sivers' post, which sounds funny, but it's actually accurate, um, says that, that uh, the quality of an idea is a multiplier and it can multiply for, you know, a bad idea is negative one. You know, a so-so idea is zero. An okay idea is one. You know, a good idea is 10. Uh, you know, a great idea is 100. Um, and so it multiplies execution and execution if you don't execute at all it's a dollar right 
if you you know if you execute you know uh, you know you know poorly, it's like ten, and you know, and it goes all the way up to hundred, you know, a thousand, a million. And so basically, if you want to have a uh, a company that is worth you know twenty million dollars, you know, you have to have you know ten million dollars worth of execution and a, you know twenty idea, and a, you know, to 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 tie them together. Uh, and so, therefore, what investors look for is to see how you've taken the idea. I mean, if you have a bad idea, nobody's going to invest in it. But if, even if you have a good idea, they want to see what have you done with it. Show me. That's why I, I was talking more about traction. You take that idea, begin to execute however you can. Your money, friends and family, your credit cards, getting in co-founders, getting a grant from an accelerator program or a government. What, I don't care how you do it. Get the tiniest little bit of cash in need to do it and make a minimum viable product get something out there the least shortest tiniest product that somebody will buy and pay you money for and then when it's out there show me that people are actually buying it and you could do a repetitive you know put it out there somebody buys it we're going out somebody buys it and and that's the business that you know our early stage investors angel investors invest in businesses that have some traction where you can show that what you're doing somebody else finds of value and even if it's very early in the process and you're making very little amounts of money um, and you're overall just losing money but once you have that traction that's where angel investors come in if you want to pick up that that's okay we can just cut this part. Oh, sorry, they're 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 drilling on outside. Ah, they're drilling. I thought it was a cell phone. So. Oh, there are guys on a scaffold out my window over here who are drilling. Oh, it's okay. It's normal. In, in every city, there's building. So okay. Mm, there was something I saw in 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 your TED talk, an awesome TED talk that any person who wants to pitch an idea. I think it's not only for businesses, like in, or or to or for investors, but in general, if you have an idea and you want co to convince people about your idea, you should see this TED talk by David S. Rose. It's awesome. I really like it. And I would. There was something super particular that I really like, and is that you start saying when an investor invests in a company, what are they uh, like analyzing or, or what are they investing on? And you said just one word, you. Right. So, right. so uh, there's this, this talk is really interesting because I was going to ask you before watching this talk, what do you look for in a company to invest? But I think the right question would be, what do you look for in an entrepreneur to invest? Well, the, the answer is they're both. They're both good questions. And, and that's where investors look at both things, right? So on the one hand, you know, if you're investing in a company that is, you know, making buggy whips for horse and carriages and there are no more horse and carriages, that's not going to be a successful business, right? So you want, so the things you're looking for are investing in companies that are addressing businesses that are in a market now where there's a large market. People are spending money in this market, number one. And number two, the market is growing because there's a, a saying uh, in English, a rising tide that lifts all boats. By the same token, a, a market in which people are growing, 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 there's room for companies to make mistakes and more companies to come in. And even if one company succeeds, it doesn't mean another one fails. So we're looking for a market that is a, a broad and a large and growing market. Um, you're looking for a business model that makes sense, that is scalable. Um, and so scalability, the term comes up again and again and again. I want something that, that once you can show that it works, In, and that you're doing on your minimum viable product that's the traction you've got something you build very cheaply but now all it needs you have a little machine it's like printing money and your machine says you put in one dollar and you and at the other end you get two dollars out and profit the other side and so that's what i want it's as it scales i can put in ten dollars and get two hundred dollars twenty dollars out the other side and put in a thousand and get two thousand out the other side so that's scaling the first kind and the second kind of scaling is a business that scales up and gets better as it gets bigger. So for example, if you had, you know, one paper cup that you were selling, you to build all of Amazon to sell one paper cup would be cost prohibitive. But having built Amazon, they can now sell another paper cup or two more kinds of paper cups with no additional cost at all. So that's called economies of scale. A business that gets bigger and improves, it gets bigger. That's a great business model. It's a scale of a model that we want to work in as, as, as well. Um, so we're looking for all these kinds of you know things that have a good business model, businesses that are a large market where you have, have, have traction. But the number one thing we invest in 
is the person, is the founder, the entrepreneur. And again, in English, it's a saying, bet the jockey, not the horse. If you're going to a horse race, you know, bet on the person who's riding it, not on the horse that they're riding, because a good jockey can make even a mediocre horse win. And by the same token, uh, in the case of the, uh, the startup company, even if the idea is good, we're looking at the founder. We're looking at the CEO, the entrepreneur, to say, is she the person I want to back? Do I trust her? Because when you start up a company, bad things happen all the time to everybody. And so the odds are that whatever great idea you had the first time when you came in, you know what? Eh, you tried it, it didn't work. So now you got to do something else. So all of a sudden, if that idea is out the window, if I was betting on just the idea, bah, I'd lose my money. But instead, if I'm betting on you, I'm betting that you're going to turn around and make something work. You'll pivot, you'll do another thing. And so that's really important. So then the question comes, all right, we've decided to invest in this company. I'm looking at all these things. And the most important thing is you. Now what, I look, what am I looking for in, in you? Uh, it has nothing to do with the city you're in, the country you're in, your gender, your age, your whatever, nothing. What I look for is, well, I'll give you the 10 things that I as an investor look for. The first one doesn't come up too often in, in business school books or, or tech crunch articles or so on and so forth, but it is absolutely of number one importance to me and is really important to most other investors. And that is integrity. Can I trust you? The number one thing I look for in a founder is integrity. That's what's of called. course, you're not going to give your money just to somebody who seems a bit of a crook, so, or I'm not really tiny, trustworthy in the long run. I mean, a tiny, tiny bit of crook. I mean, the bottom line is, if I get the slightest smell that there is anything not perfectly straight and clean about you, I just simply won't invest. And most other investors will not either. So integrity is absolutely critically important, number one. Number two, an entrepreneur is somebody who is, who is starting a business from nothing and growing it to the moon. And so to do that requires passion. I mean, you could tell from my speaking patterns here, I'm a passionate person, passionate about my business, passionate about entrepreneurship, passionate about teaching, um, and you require that passion in an entrepreneur. Now, it doesn't have to be my kind of passion, which is very loud and fast talking and hand waving and so on and so forth. It can be a very firm, intense passion. But it has to be a passion because passion is what drives you, as you see with all the entrepreneurs you, you dealt with. It drives you to create that business and it pushes you through the bad times and pulls you to the good times. So passion is really important. And so if I find an entrepreneur lacking either integrity or who might be lacking in integrity or lacking in passion, oh yeah, they're coming to work. Then no, that doesn't work, right? Those are killers. The next thing we look for is experience. And experience can be broken down. There are three different kinds of experience that we look for. One of them is startup experience. Have you ever done a startup before? Because like riding a bicycle until you actually do it, you can't know how, you can't learn how to ride a bicycle from a book. Um, in the same way, even though I have a really great book that people should get, it's called The Startup Checklist, but it's up to a scalable high growth business. Um, nevertheless, you have to actually do it before you really understand this. And so therefore we look for, to say, have you as a founder ever started a company before? And it almost doesn't matter whether it succeeded or failed. If it succeeded before, then there's actually a good chance that it'll, you'll succeed the second time. But even if you failed the first time, that's okay, because you learned the lessons about creating this business uh, and starting a business and running a business. And so therefore, you have expertise, experience in starting a business. If you're a first-time entrepreneur, and all entrepreneurs at some point are first-time entrepreneurs, then you don't. But what do you do? You don't say, no. You say, you help me understand how you've done very similar things. Did you, when you were in school, did you start a sports team? Did you conduct a thing for your church where you came up with an idea and convinced people to come and join you and do something? Show me how you, you've done. If you haven't started a company, what else have you started? Something? Because if you're a real entrepreneur who I'm going to be betting on here, you will likely have started something in your life beforehand. This isn't the first thing you've ever started. You may have started a uh, school program or a, or a hobby thing or a charity thing. Help me understand what you think you're a starter, somebody who's actually started a business and kept going with it before. So that's, you know, uh, startup experience. Um, the but next that would be also a good point not to wait till you have lots of money or everything figured out to start things. No? No. You were saying that at the beginning you started when you were a little cute, small entrepreneur. So you can have like a, a very small business even in high school 
or even elementary school. I mean, are, there are very bright kids that start really early and it doesn't have to be the million dollar business, but it's making oh, experience. No, absolutely. And as, as a matter of fact, you know, one of one of the, the, the biggest challenges is that it, for, for with a lot of people um, is that they spend all their time waiting, waiting someday, maybe at some point in the future, I'll have money or I'll have the ability to go, you know, do something. Um, and those people never actually start businesses. And it, whereas somebody who says, okay, I'm going to start. I'm not, I don't know what the answer is necessarily. I don't know. I'm not guaranteed sure about everything. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to start. That's the kind of person who you invest in because entrepreneurs actually go ahead uh, and, and start businesses. Um, and so you were asking about cute David the entrepreneur. Let me see if I can sign camera over here. Um, oh, I just lost your audio there. Hold on a second. So, so that's that's David as Rose as an entrepreneur and about uh, fifth, fifth or sixth grade there. So. Oh, that's so cute! You will have to lend us that picture to put it to put it in the edit of the video. Also, it's all so nice. <laughs> so, so in any event, the things we look for, right? So we look for startup experience. You know, integrity first of all, passion, startup experience. The next thing we look for is domain experience, domain expertise. If you're starting a company in the construction business, have you ever started a construction company before? If you're, if you're selling handbags, what do you know about the fashion business retail? So you don't want somebody coming in totally out of left field. I want to know that you know the industry or somebody on your team really knows the industry. Then the third kind of experience is are the skills that it takes to run a business. Um, product development, coding, marketing, sales, finance, operations, all those things. Nobody knows all of those things, but we want to know that you've got them covered. You know, how do you have co-founders? What skills are yours? What have you, you know, what are you going to use contractors for? Um, how are people going to join your team? And then if you have people who are joining your team, the next question is leadership. Do we think you're a leader? Will people follow you? Well, I want to work for you kind of thing, right? Um, and so, you know, it's hard to define leadership, but you know it when you see it. Uh, and so it's important that we, you invest in somebody, they're going to be the CEO, they're going to run the company, who is a good, strong leader. And one of the things that lets a leader recruit people um, to work in this company is the question of commitment. Nobody wants to you know, feel that if, they, if things get tough, the leader will go out you know, on vacation at Cancun and forget it, you know, uh, and the business shuts down. No, you've got to stay and work hard in this business. And so commitment is something I look for as well. Once you take my money as an investor, <clears throat> you have no right to shut the business down. You, you can't stop this business. You can't go on vacation without, you know, I mean, realistically for a long time, if there's a startup entrepreneur without checking with me. So you can't stop the company until I drag it from your cold, dead fingers. So commitment. Now, what is it that helps drive you your commitment? Well, one of those things <clears throat> is vision. Do you see something really, really big? And so when, when Steve Jobs wrote Apple Computer's first motto, it was Apple Computer changing the world. <clears throat> not building an iPhone, not building a computer, changing the world. And so we look for entrepreneurs who are world changing entrepreneurs, who see something bigger than them. Because if you aim small, you'll get small. If you, you know, there's a saying, if you reach for the stars, you know, you may not get there, but you'll at least get off the earth, right? You'll at least, you know, get to the, to the moon. Um, and so you want somebody who is really ambitious and has a vision of seeing how things can grow. But at the same time, if all you have is vision and you see visions of sugar plums dancing in your head, oh, this would be all great and wonderful, but have no idea how to get there, that's not good either. So we want to see people who are realistic as well as visionary, combining the vision, but knowing how you're going to get there. And then finally, because you're going to be pivoting, things are going to change, bad stuff's going to happen. Um, and I've probably done this one with you have. Um, I want an entrepreneur who is flexible, who is coachable, who will listen when I say something. Not necessarily do it. I'm not running your business. You're in your business. But if I give you advice, at least listen to it before you throw it away. And that's what we're looking for. So those are the sort of the 10 facts we look for in a person that feeds into that's the entrepreneur and that's the company. In that last point, I think it's very interesting how just learning to say, Oh, thank you. I'll think about it. It's a great skill to have because it's very crazy how mo like lots of entrepreneurs, uh, like they like usually when you get a new idea that is very different to yours, maybe you say, I have been doing this. Why should I accept this? And then you fight it in the beginning. So you don't give this idea the time 
you evolve in your head. And maybe you don't take 100% of that idea, or maybe that idea helps you reinforce what you were thinking. But I think that point you just made is super valuable for any entrepreneur. And by the way, uh, all the ones, like, like if you're an entrepreneur, not an investor and you're watching, this uh, YouTube video, uh, David has a great book that is called The Startup Checklist, 25 Steps to a Scalable High Growth Business. I'm going to uh, have the link in the description below. So if you want to have a scalable high growth business, you should read that book definitely. And David, I would like you to share with us like maybe one of your very early successes in in investing like one company that maybe was one of the first that was really a home run for you and of course a failure and what did you learn from it because as you told us you are going to invest in 20 to 80 companies but you're go you're not going to have return on all of them mm -hmm. so i've had a, a, i've been lucky to have uh, a number of very interesting exits um one of the most interesting ones not that it was a more actually more recent not an early one but it's an interesting one uh, is about, so actually it's a way, way back, about seven years ago, uh, I was at a meetup, a New York tech meetup, and that's the group, sort of tech industry meetup in New York City, and they have demonstrations of, of cool new technology every month. Um, and one of the people who was presenting was a guy showing, uh, presenting about a bicycle sharing system. Um, and so the idea was that instead of having your own bicycle, you could share bikes. Now the first generation bike share systems which started in Amsterdam and probably 20 years ago or so, were just bikes. And they would, you get a key and there's a lock and they lock the bikes in the canal, posts or whatever, and you'd unlock it and you'd, and you'd do it. Um, but then when bike share began to be big, um, they, you got the second generation bike sharing system. And the second generation system had the smart hub. It was a bike that locked into this automatic docking hub. Um, and you would then come up to a, a, the location where the hub was and you'd use your credit card or your ID card and you would unlock a bike and then ride it to another hub uh, and, and lock it in. And you could use your phone to see how many bikes there were in each hub and so on and so forth. Um, and so that was the second generation bike share system. They did that in Paris and in New York and in Boston, San Francisco and a bunch of other you know, you know, major cities uh, in the US and in the West. Uh, and then what this guy was showing, this entrepreneur, was a third generation bike share system. And so he said, okay, instead of having all the smarts in the hub, the smart the smart hub or, or dock, the smart dock system, you put in a bike and then it would, all you could do was see how many bikes were in the dock. Um, instead, let's take all the intelligence and put it on the bike. Let's actually put a computer on the bike itself with GPS and 4G wireless location sensing ability to have a you know, lock and unlock bike code and so on and so forth. And that way, you don't actually need these docks. You can have a dockless bike share solution where you can uh, just lock your bike to a, you know, a lamppost or something. And then anybody can pick up the phone and see where that actual bike is because of GPS and go unlock the bike with your phone. So I thought that was very cool technologies. And, and my background actually is in urban planning. So I thought that'd be great for a city like New York. So I, I rushed down and I said, I got a miss in this company. And he thought I was a crazy person. But I actually eventually invested. I led the first round of investment in the company, became chairman of the board. Um, and for six years, we've been, the company's been growing. It's called Social Bicycles. Um, and we're putting bicycles in all kinds of, of uh, cities around the United States. And then a funny thing happened. The funny thing was Uber and ride sharing and Lyft and all those guys coming into play. And so now transportation is becoming a completely um, integrated system. Uh, and Uber, which is now lets you order a car up online. The question is, people want to use a car, you can use Uber delivery. Well, how about if you could use a bike? And so to make a very long story short, Uber a few months ago acquired my company, uh, Jump Bicycles, uh, as their first acquisition in several years. And they paid, the amount wasn't uh, disclosed, but it was a very, very, very sizable amount. And so Jump Bikes, which is what it was renamed to, is now Uber Bikes, is now the, is now the, the back end of, of Uber Bikes. So that was a really cool thing where I, I, I love the idea. I love the entrepreneur. I added value as chairman of the board for seven years, and then it got sold to um, a major player for a lot of cash, and everybody did very well. So that well, and that's and that's really going super big. Like even in Latin America, we are starting to see some bikes that work with that kind of system. I mean, Mexico City didn't used to be like the 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 most 
bike friendly city but from some years to now people start using it we have like some special some special roads and, and stuff and we had like this uh eco bc that was like the second generation of bikes and then they are starting so it was very interesting that it was a trend that maybe started years ago and that you had like the the vision to to so, invest in it and uh, it's great uh, that, uh, that uh, you had an exit <laughs> So that was a successful company. Now for a not so successful company, um, and this is one of the reasons why I realized the commitment is so important. Uh, this was a company that had an iPad application for travel, booking and sharing. The, the idea was you would share travel planning with a group of people and they could all you know, work on the schedule together and they could split the, uh, the costs for reservations and tickets and stuff. Very clever idea and it was a beautiful iPad application uh, it had two really strong co-founders. One of them had been uh, the CFO for an airline in the United States uh, who helped get it going here. And the other one was a, was a uh, the iPad project team leader from Apple who brought his whole team with him from Apple. So it was looking really, really good and an interesting company. We invested in the company. Uh, about two months after we invested, uh, they released their product in the Apple App Store for iPads. And surprisingly, people didn't really download it. And those who downloaded it didn't really use it. So it was sort of discouraging. And that wouldn't have been too bad because bad things happen to companies. You pivot and you redo it and you try and go, go away. However, the co-founding CTO, the person who had designed this program and who had come out of Apple's uh, iPad operation, um, at that point said, oh, you know what? I just had a baby. So, um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave and and you know, and go off somewhere else. And so, you know, he had, and he had invested himself like a quarter of a million dollars. The the two founders each invested a quarter of a million dollars into the company. It's seed money, which is a lot of money. He said, "Oh yeah, you keep money. I'll keep my my interest here." And and uh, but I'm 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 leaving. He's leaving. What? I just invested in the company over here. Well, not and it was his idea. <laughs> not, not only did he leave? But all the engineers he hired left, walked right out after him. So, so here was a company that literally three months after I invested, the co-founding CEO left, the engineers left, the, the, the product wasn't being developed, um, and uh, the poor remaining founder, who was a straight shooting guy, and said, "I'm going to try and you know." We, at that point, we said, "Okay, well, this was not a great success, but tell you what, give us back the remaining cash in here." And he said, "No, I'm going to try and make it work." And so he, you know, we support our entrepreneurs. So he tried to make it work for quite a while, and it took a couple of years, and he didn't ultimately didn't work, and so the company shut down. So that's well. If you're a, if you're a technological company and your technological team leaves, it's kind of complicated, I guess. So you know, so, so yeah. in this particular case, it was a question of of the founder, you know, not you know of walking away and not being committed to the company, and that's a, a mistake I haven't made since then. I also wanted to ask you about, like, right now you are a founder of Singularity University and you also talk about a lot of things. Well, you have very interesting lectures in Singularity University. And I wanted to ask you a trend and, that, and something more general about how exponential technologies are changing the investment world. But first, since we have some smaller investors uh, that maybe are thinking about crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding. I wanted to ask you, do you think equity crowdfunding uh, could be an interesting way to start if you still don't have the millions to be an angel investor? Sure, equity crowdfunding is a very interesting space. I, when, when it was uh, started in the United States, which actually is, is a lot farther behind a lot of other places, uh, certainly in the UK and some in Europe, and. Uh, some in Latin America, um, the idea was it's going to revolutionize the whole world. Everybody's going to become an angel investor tomorrow morning. All kinds of millions of entrepreneurs are going to be funded. That was ridiculous. It didn't happen. There are a lot of rules and regulations. It's really tough to do it. That being said, there have been a few hundred companies that have raised money through equity crowdfunding platforms. And for them, it absolutely works. And, and for investors, it provides a way to let somebody else do some of the, the initial winnowing down and screening, picking companies that you can then choose in which one to invest. Um, so yeah, I think uh, equity crowdfunding is a very interesting and useful way to get started. Probably. If you're a first-time angel investor and you're looking to get into angel investing and you are an accredited investor, you have the cash to invest, um, typically the best thing you can do is join a group of angel investors, an angel group, 
uh, and they're all over the world. We have over 700 angel groups that we support on our platform, our, our Gus platform. Um, and if you join the local group, they have deal flow. There are other members there who can help you, um, you know, sort through it all, who can uh, give you advice and comments, and you can aggregate everybody's capital. So you're all, um, you know, investing into one company uh, more than you could invest individually. So um, an angel group is a great place to start. If you can't find an angel group with you or that doesn't work near you, that doesn't work for you, then investing in an online platform um, in the US, there are, are ones like uh, Seed Invest and Circle Up and so on. Uh, in the UK, you have, you know, Crowdcube and, um, you know, a bunch of others. Uh, so, the, so yes, I think that the equity funding platforms can be a very interesting way to get started. Just a quick question. Uh, Gust has uh, different angel groups also in Latin America. Mm -hmm. On Gust, there are, you go to gust.com. Um, we have over 3,000 investment organizations that use Gust to manage all of their applications at this point. We have a majority of the world's accelerator programs, including many in Latin America. Uh, we have angel groups, including many in Latin America. Um, and so you can search for angel groups to, if you're an entrepreneur looking for funding or an investor who wants to join a group, you can just go on to gust.com and magnifying glass to search and go ahead and, uh, and search by country, by city, by region. There are some Latin American unicorns from Colombia, even one from Mexico that are starting to emerge. Uh, I don't know. I mean, this is. We, we this is a, a question that I am not sure if, if you're familiar with, but I, I wanted to ask you if you have any like vision about this uh, market, like for investing. I'm, I'm, I don't have as much as I would like, so I don't, I'm not going to opine and provide wrong information or talk out of my hat. Um, but what you're seeing now is a great flattening of the world. I mean, technology. I mean, everybody is using Amazon Web Services. It doesn't matter whether you're American or Latin America or in Europe. You know, so you have the tools that are out there. So there are a great many tools. The essence of the internet is it's crossing borders, uh, and so you're now seeing a world in which, you know, capital can come from anywhere, ideas can come from anywhere, people can come from anywhere, entrepreneurs can start a company anywhere. Uh, so yes, that's actually going to be very important, and you're going to see the whole world connected. And so what's going to happen in Latin America? is exactly what's going to happen, what has happened here in the US or in the UK or other places. Well, David, I don't know if there's any piece of advice that you want to give to entrepreneurs or angel investors. For me, it was a huge pleasure to talk to you. I, I really appreciate that you took the time to talk to us. And I, I really think a lot of people will profit from your TED Talks, from your, if you have the chance to go to any of Singularity University lectures or any lecture, uh, that, that David has like in, in the further dates, really go for it. And I really, really recommend your books, but I don't know if you have like, uh, like you have given us a lot of advice, but anything else you want to share with us? No. So if you're an entrepreneur, have the courage of your convictions, do it. So in the end, the essence of entrepreneurship is just doing it. Don't read, you know, my book is great, read my book, but don't let that stop you from doing it. Listen to podcasts, they're great, but don't let that stop you from doing it. The difference between an entrepreneur and anybody else is that an entrepreneur does it, just do it. And that's, and once you start there, you'll make mistakes, you'll fall on your face, you'll learn from your mistakes, you'll get up again. But if you don't start, you'll never get anywhere. So if you're an entrepreneur, just do it. And if you're an investor who is looking to invest in these early stage companies, be very patient and love your entrepreneur. They need all the help and support they can get. Oh, that's so great. Well, thank you, David. We, I think we all leave this chat, this, this transmission really, really inspired. And thank you again. Uh, we will provide all the information on David so you can follow him on Twitter, uh, take a look at Ghost. And I don't know if we can read your article somewhere or do you have a Medium account or something like that? Read my answers on Quora. There's a question and answer website called Quora, Q U O R A, where I've written over 7,000 answers about all this stuff. So you can read them uh, for free on, online there. So thank you very much and good luck with the podcast and to all you capitalist pigs out there. Well, thank you very much for everybody to, for all the people that have seen this uh, video. I think it will be very useful. And remember, we have these kind of videos once a month. So uh, let us know what you thought, if you feel really 
like interested in angel investing or becoming an entrepreneur, this is Legal Capitalist Speak, and I'll I'll see you next week. Bye bye. Bye.